session is a very uh, interesting one because we're moving away from macros to markets, right? And uh, we're calling this a jugalbandi between two market masters. Uh, and they are really market masters in the true sense of the word because between them, they've got some, uh, I think, at least 80 years of market experience. They've seen the highs, the lows. They've seen crises. They've seen booms, busts. Uh, really experienced it all. I'm talking about uh, Ramdeo Ogarwalji and uh, <clears throat> Manish Chokani, who are our next panelists. And this Jugalbandi is between them, no pesky anchors in between. Uh, you know, Ramdeoji, really, I mean, actually, both of them need no uh, introduction, uh, but I'll just say a few words. I think uh, Ramdeoji is someone who is a passionate, passionate investor. Uh, he is, he's got a childlike enthusiasm for ideas. I mean, I remember the first time that I met him, uh, you know, I came back with a list. And it was not a list which was basically made up of uh, stocks or themes or anything. It was a reading list. Uh, so I consider Ramdevji first and foremost a teacher, a mentor. Uh, and his message uh, to me and I think others over the years has been read, 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 read every day. And, uh, you know, uh, you have a hope uh, to succeed. Uh, so uh, Ramdevji, thank you very much for your wisdom all these years. I uh, really appreciate it. Manish Shokani uh, needs no introduction either. He's one of the most astute uh, market investors that we have amidst us. Uh, his grasp on macros and markets and distilling the macros to the micros uh, is, I think, unparalleled. Uh, he simplifies complex ideas guided by first principles, and I think that is where he really excels. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, request both Ramdevji and Manish to take the stage and uh, uh, dare I say, entertain with us with his Yugal Bandi. Over to you guys. This is the scariest thing we've done, completely unscripted. <laughs> and then Ramdev went and put his foot in his mouth asking him about economic forecasts. What if they ask us about market forecast? <laughs> He only missed by 100 or 150 basis points. We get it wrong by 10 percentage points. But at least we can say we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we can start off. He's, uh, I was at pains to tell Sonia that you're 10 years older than me. So you should, uh, <laughs> you should have the first bite of the cherry. Yeah. And you should uh, kick off on, maybe uh, as uh, Shirin introduced in the beginning, you connect the dots backward. So how the last 40 years, because you've been there, I think, since the 80s. I came only in the 90s. So maybe, no, no, I, I say it with, uh, not, not in jest, but because he saw the, the kind of 10x of the index in the first decade, and then the mania of Harshad Mehta and how that played out. And we may well be setting up for that. So I think we are both in sort of that camp. Uh, maybe I'll leave it with you. So actually, uh uh, it's a terrific time to remember 1992. Uh, I mean, I have seen firsthand, actually, 85 was the first boom, which was uh, VP Singh and uh, Rajiv Gandhi combined. And uh, that was a kind of mini boom. The stock market just doubled in one year. So that was a small. And uh, then came the 1990-92 boom. I think it is his... He, he just said the market doubled in one year, just in passing. But just listen to the second one. When the index went 6x from 700 to 4200 sensex in 19 months flat, that gave birth to Ramdev and Moti and into Moti Lal Oswal. So uh, I started with zero money. I was zero, literally zero negative rather. And we made 30 crores in 19 months. Wow. And that became the seed capital for Moti Lal Oswal. So, yeah. Then came the next bull run was the Y2K bull run. Then came the GFC, the uh, commodity bull run, rise of China. It was actually the rise of China, commodities and everything. And then we had little lull and then pre-COVID. So uh, I, my sense is what I've seen in 1992, this is 10x of 1992. We are into seriously very large bull run. The issue is this time there is a SEBI. There is an, <laughs> there is an RBI with a complete digital system. They actually can see what Badmashi we are doing. So uh, the, with the police, the crowd will be a little, limited, uh, a little disciplined. So my sense is eventually will run much more, but it will be a little prolonged. So my sense is that this is a, I mean, uh, I think this is a retirement time for us. If this bull run, for you, for you, for you I'm still I'm ten, 10 years younger. Yeah, so you'll see another bull run. <laughs> 
So as Prashant said, I'll, I'll just supplement. As he said, it's useful sometimes to give context in which this is happening. Uh, and uh, Keki will know this well also, that when we broke the Bretton Woods standard, and the US started basically printing money and we all pegged to the dollar, every decade we had a mania in some market or the other. So in the 70s, you had the Nifty 50 in the US with the Disney's and the Kodak's and all. Uh, sorry, that was 60s. 70s, then it goes to commodities, which is gold and silver and all of that. Uh, and the famous Hunt brothers. 80s, it went back into commodities and emerging markets. So that was the rise of Japan and Taiwan. And all these manias go up 10 to 15 times in one decade. Then we kind of got the tail end of that, uh, of the 80s end, which really was Japan, Taiwan. And Arshad Mehta, I think, decided he wants India to participate in that. And the 90s, of course, went back to tech and US and the NASDAQ. And then the 2000 to 2010 period came back to commodities and emerging markets in which India, China all benefited. And that was the rise of our great bull run as well of the 2000s. The last decade, again, we saw 2010 to 2020 going back to financials, technology, the FANG mania. And that's why the supposition for most investors in the world is, again, this decade comes back to commodities and India. Uh, and to Samiran's point about how do we play this game this time? And fortunately, RBI keeps coming and you know keeping the market cool from the debt side. And SEBI is doing a great job getting the froth down. Because what you don't want is all the returns to be front-ended. Yeah. Don't, don't have, have parabolic have, market. Yeah, and then you have 20 years of a bear market which follows. Yeah. <laughs> so if we, go up 10, happen. if we go 10 to 15x in yeah. this decade, that would resemble what happened to uh, Japan in the 80s and what happened to China. No, even in India, 92, 92 yeah. to 2002. Right. So that was a very bad period. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that's a good cue for you to now talk about the retail investor and the rise of retail yeah, in so India. So why I'm saying this is that uh, rise of retail investor and the, the force of it, people have still not, I mean, now people are getting sense of it, but they have still not understood. Till 2020, we are getting about 300 to 400,000 customers per day, per month, at the industry as a whole. Come COVID, the, uh, digital onboarding starts, no uh, physical checkup for onboarding. In five, five minutes, you will start your trading and all. And we start getting four to five million customers per month. Four to five million customers per month. From 40 million DMED accounts, now we have clocked 150 million. And I think in, this is three-year story. And when you imagine five million customers a month, and these customers are cumulative in character. They're not flow. They are cumulative in character. And we are headed for maybe 300 million straight in three to four years. And maybe, I don't know what is the end game. Maybe 10 years of 500 million. So this is an uh, amazing uh, stock market boom. Uh, stock market liquidity inflow into the market. Now what it does is, of course, it lifts the, all the stock prices, mid cap, small cap, large cap. Anything goes. And last year, I think 2023, 20, 2024, the return for across the portfolio, at least in uh, my AMC and what I invest in generally, uh, is about 50% across the portfolio I'm saying. It's not, I'm not about one scheme or one stock. I'm talking about the entire portfolio. Extremely diversified. Literally, I bought the market. So that is 50%. So you imagine the kind of bull run which is lying, underlying, despite all the restrictions by SEBI regulators and everything. So, and we have still done 150 million. Now you imagine people, when it was 50 million, the 50 million satisfied customers were there, and they were saying, brothers, come and enjoy the, uh, the bull run. Now there are 150 million customers saying, boss, this is fun, a lot of fun, please come. So you are getting not a smaller number of DMED accounts. You are getting larger number of DMED accounts. I have never seen in my uh, office somebody coming and saying, sir, I have 500 crores fixed deposit, what do I do? Or 1,000 crores fixed deposit, what do I do? So this is the kind of shift which is going to happen from fixed deposit to the mutual funds or whatever, stock market. The investment so, cycle is back. It's not happening yeah. on the ground, it's so happening in the stock market. What is going market. to happen is, my sense is, one is that stock prices are up, then what happens is, the, the, the supply response comes in. There's a demand response. Now there is supply response. So all the uh, IPOs, you're seeing 50 times, 60 times, then QIPs, but put together, they're just about a lakh crore, a lakh 25,000, 30,000 or something. 
the actual flow is almost five to six lakh crores and growing. So there is still, this year is second, third year, this is still excess, sub, excess demand, then supply. So I don't know how, how fast. I would, I would expect government to uh, at least uh, divest a lakh or two lakh crore worth of stuff immediately after the election. Uh, obviously, don't expect before election. And uh, so after election, and uh, the larger corporates like Geo and all those big ones which are waiting in queue, 50,000, 1 lakh crore kind of IPOs, let that come. I think we are going to see all of them coming in. Uh, so I think the supply response should come, and that will broaden the market in a very healthy way. And so the fund will become even bigger. I hope that is what happens, but uh, yeah. anybody's call. No, it's, it's again consistent with the phases of market which we see where the profit cycle starts in one sector, then it spreads to another sector, then the P multiples expand, and then we start creating new stories and paradigms, like 15 years ago it was BRICS will be the new engine of the world. We are setting ourselves up to say, India is the only large economy in the world of this size, which has growth ahead of it, not so what, in the rear view. What the investment theme? I mean, you are very yeah. good at... Uh... So, so there are four or five things which you see, we are just copying what's happened in other countries. So it's nothing unique. We've all trod the path before. And if you look around the world, typically, as again, Samiran was pointing out, when you get richer, you don't buy FMCG goods. You buy consumer discretionary. So you spend more money on improving your house. You'll spend a lot more on property. You'll spend on travel. You'll buy a better car. Uh, you'll do all your home improvement stuff. You'll go out to eat. So consumer discretionary is one very, very, very big play. Housing, of course, so You start unparalleled. with that, but do you, do you think it will never trickle down? No, it will, obviously, because yeah. uh, each time when you build a home, there are you know, yeah. five people who are supplying and ten people who are servicing you. And India has this unique pyramid of the 2% Australians, 18% Filipinos, uh, and then maybe a billion uh, people living in Africa, and it will trickle down. Uh, and if I then see the math, for example, 20 years ago, we were selling 1 million cars, same as China. We have barely crossed 4 million today. China is at 26 million cars. We sell something like 12 or 13 million air conditioners. China is at 220. So that's the scale of change which lies ahead of us in the next 10 years. So that's, of course, one. Uh, second is, as the government uh, privatizes effectively to the private sector, so you've seen uh, effectively uh, Reliance and Bharti have run the telecom infrastructure of India, and we couldn't have run the country in COVID if this wasn't there. Or Adani now runs the ports and the airports of India. Uh, Indigo, pretty much Indigo and Tata will run the airlines of India. So all of these privatization beneficiaries will become very, very large. The profit size is very, very large over here. So that's item two. You and I may not participate because these are not traditionally high return businesses. But you're getting the likes of Blackstone and others to come in. They're taking over even the commercial properties and building REITs. So that's kind of item two. Item three, I know we all enjoy doing the Zomatos and all of the world with the internet-enabled businesses uh, can become very, very large in the country. And like, like you said, in your own field, uh, the rise of Zerodha or even Angel and even yourselves, with what happens with the rise of internet and making life so easy for people, it just explodes the business. Uh, and I think we've been beneficiaries of that in our life as well. So that clearly is number three. But the biggest mega theme, and uh, I'm sure Keki and uh, Vedya will talk about it, is financialization. We are a $4 trillion economy. We save 25%. There's a trillion dollars of saving every year. Of that today, only half comes to financial assets. Half is still going to physically buying real estate or gold. So first of all, that has to get financialized. Within that, the share of the banking system has to become much, much larger. And I'm, I'm not going to do this because I'm sure Vaidya and KK will banking system it. will be larger? Significantly larger. I give you, okay, let me give you one good stat. Uh, and although I know you, know you have an AMC and we both love the mutual fund business, but just for context, uh, HDFC uh, bank today would be, what, a $60 billion uh, net worth for a bank which is 20% of India's banking system. Uh, and let's say it'll be a 600 billion odd balance sheet size. If you are saying this country gets to five and 10 trillion, and let's say we only want 15% compounding, which is four times. So HDFC bank needs to get to $240 billion market cap. At a $240 billion market cap, 
uh, uh, a $240 billion net worth, it will be a $2.5 trillion balance sheet, which is still very, very tiny for a country of this size in the context of a $10 trillion uh, you know, economy. But do you think, yes, size will increase, but do you think the economics, will it be in their favor? Because they It will be, because like I said, A, you're taking share away from real estate and gold, then you'll take away share from public sector banks. What about uh, uh, actually bank deposits going to the stock and markets? So, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So let's again take the same math. The biggest mutual fund today, and I'm just rounding off, uh, I don't want my friend in SBI to be unhappy, but let's say HDFC mutual fund is a $10 billion market cap. And let's say you want to compound at 25%, so you get to a $100 billion market cap. With a $100 billion market cap, at some point he will sell at 4% of AUM, more or less, which is what the world average is. Today it's priced for perfection. To get to 100 billion, now you multiply that by 25x. So he needs to be two and a half trillion dollar AUM. It's impossible. Whatever you do, it's not going to happen. So mathematically, you will make a better return in the bank than in the mutual fund, while the business will do better in the mutual fund. It will compound faster, but you won't make a stock return in it, as an example. And I wish uh, Navneet well, I don't want him to come and beat me up, but both are friends. And I own both businesses today. But uh, like I told you in our last Diwali interaction, that you will be 10x in 10 years. But what, are, what we have seen in America... The amounts are minuscule. And, you know, Vaidya will... I mean, Vaidya is what? He's... Uh, 30 or 1,000 crore uh, net worth today. And he's, he's guided, so I can share it publicly. He's saying, I'll grow 25% for five years. So he'll be 3x in five years. At that point also, he's uh, 90,000 crore uh, net worth. No, I'm not, I'm not doting your it's figures. A, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, what I'm saying is a shift, the pace at which people are shifting their bank deposits to stock yeah. market side. Yeah. If it I'm is, glad Nilesh just walked in. He missed all the mutual yeah, fund yeah. numbers. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, if by chance, there is a 17, 18 lakh crore right. accretion on the bank deposit side. Yeah. It's too and tiny. That's just, what I'm saying. It's a just trickle. listen to me. And just about 5, 6 lakh crores on the mutual fund side or yeah. entire stock market side. If that goes to next year, sure. 10 lakhs to mutual fund or capital markets, sure. and deposit accretion only is 18, 19 lakh crores. Sure. Then what happens to the cost of deposit? You see, it can be a circular argument. We can argue it won't happen and therefore the cost will go up. I'm, I'm just giving you the aggregate numbers that Banks, banks may be 80%, mutual funds may be 20 Over time, the mix will change. But the country is still compounding at a certain rate, yeah, yeah. and you're still taking away share from real estate and gold. So it's not one is winning at the expense of the other. And I'm saying mutual funds will compound 25%. Banks need to only do 15 The end point trajectory still, you cannot imagine a HGFC mutual fund at 2.5 trillion at that point. But you, you can imagine it for the bank. It's, it's, it's a done deal. So but the I, I'll just came, leave it at that. But the valuation can be, instead of 4%, it can be 8% to the... Uh, I, I, yeah, I'd, so I'd not argue with. What I'm saying, we can keep arguing <laughs> yeah, yeah, the numbers. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Let's move on to something so, else. So, uh, why didn't you pick? <laughs> 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 all, I think all we agree, we are extremely bullish on, uh, you know, life. We, are bullish, we, we no, both think can, there's a bubble Manish, possibility the, forming Manish, in India. The real issue is what all can go wrong. Yeah. Because we can, I mean, we are all born bullish, parma bull and all. But a lot of things can go wrong, it will go wrong. Sure. But what are the things you see going wrong? See, uh, I, I've had this line for long that whenever you want to be bullish in India, you look at the business and you find all the reasons to be bullish. Whenever you want to make a bear case for India, you look at the macro and you'll get very, very bearish. But we've gone through Cargill, we've gone through you know, coalition governments, we've gone through COVID, we've gone through everything. Somehow, the miracle of our country is the entrepreneurs are great, the sense innate of business is great, you may get a one or two year break or a six month break in, in your investment returns. But eventually the power of profit and the compounding of profit is what has given us our returns. If, if I look back to when I started my life, again I remind you 10 years after you, <laughs> the profit of Reliance Industries was 150 crores. That's all in 1991. They are north of 80,000 crores now. They have seen U.S. put sanctions, Cargill has happened, COVID has happened, this has happened, that has happened, see where they are. But do you think, do you think supply, you know, because the valuations are unre yeah. not unreasonable, but right. definitely demanding. Do you think supply can be, uh, supply can overwhelm the demand side in terms if, of paper well, supply? If, see, again, it's a matter of horizon that if it, sub it depresses the market now, you will say this supply is creating the investment cycle because 
if I raise 2 lakh crores of equity, no, but if foreigners raise sell, 2 lakh crores of but debt. But if foreigners sell sure. another 5% of their holding, right. then you can get enough 5 lakh crores of uh, supply. Sure. But then the bull argument will be they will come back and buy it at 10 lakh crore valuation after never come. Years. Why? Will. Once we, the market again, collapses, then they'll again, come. Uh, again, we're both bullish, so I know you're just being devil's advocate. <laughs> the reality is for any investor in the world, when you look at U.S., other than the magnificent four now, not even the seven, everything is in the rear view mirror. You look at Europe, it's nothing's going to happen. Japan, nothing's going to happen. China is already facing its own problem. So Larry Summers had this very lovely line. He said, Japan is a hospital. Europe is a museum. China is a jail. Where do you invest in the world? To paraphrase what he was saying. So if this is a $4 trillion GDP economy, which is almost inevitably going to be 10, 15, 20 over the next 10, 20 years, you would be stupid anywhere in the world to not come and make some allocation here. Today we are 3% of global allocation. If this country has to become 10, and I don't think we debate that, it's a matter of when it will happen, it's not if. For the other countries, it's a problem of if now. So yes, things can go wrong over here. Oil can go to 120 next year. There can be a war. China can go into Taiwan. He can go into Arunachal. He can go anywhere. Yeah. Let me ask but you one more thing. Can you delay the inevitable? Do, do you think, I mean, in next 12 months, 18 months, the corporate country, because you are at 22, 23 times trade. Uh, if, I'm just okay. asking money. I, I can react to that then. So yeah, yeah. You, we did no, a, listen so, to my question first. I understood where you're coming. The, the question is, where is the? <laughs> We, we had this lovely forward, I think, uh, some friends of, uh, uh, common friends with Nilesh, and he said, if you toss a coin on a daily basis, your odds are 50-50. You, when you do the investment return uh, on a three-month basis, you may at best be 60-40. When you do it on your one-year basis, it becomes 75-25 in your favor. If you do on a three-year basis, you become 90-10. So to answer the question, a short run this year, for the index, I don't think more than 5 or 10%. That's my view. We are, we are expensive, no doubt about it. But if, you, if we are indeed so bullish, we think it gets to five and $10 trillion over the next you know, five and 10 years, respectively, the size of profit pool will be so large that the con we, see, we are concerned with companies that we sit on. I don't buy the index, neither do you. And all we are doing is we are buying odds that is it priced for perfection for everything, or are there pockets available to me where I can invest? And then for each person who says, I can supply and depress the market, please remember my friend Manish is also here, who's just raised another big private equity fund. He keeps bringing fabulous companies then to the market. Just as an example, you got, uh, I think, AU, Maniavar, all these fabulous companies to the market. Uh, you are part of that as well. Uh, so one side there is supply of old, and other side there is supply of new, and there's reason to be optimistic about it. That, that's all. I can't be a blind bull like our old friend Rakesh, that at all time, 360 days, we are bullish. It is tempered. The valuations are not cheap, no, no doubt about it. But if you take a longer term view, and when I look back, uh, you know, 30 years in my case, uh, we were $275 billion GDP. We are at $4 trillion today. The size of profit pool of India was what? What was our foreign exchange reserves? Where are we today? Uh, so, I mean, whenever you are in doubt, like in global financial crisis, you wake up in the morning, slap yourself, think of the problem of a rich uncle in the world, but hold on to your portfolio. <laughs> I know we are trying hard to find bearish things, but <laughs> maybe we'll ask Samir and some, any bearish reasons for, but, well, the reality, what he says is right, that when we are all so optimistic, the prices are reflecting that. So, uh, we, are, we are confident about the economy, we are confident about corporate sector, we are confident about our savers, but this price is representing a cherry consensus. That is also there. Yeah. If something very bad, unexpected happens, it can cause a sharp sell-off, but I still think this becomes a buy-the-dip market rather than a sell-the-rallies. Uh, Manish Ramdev, uh, it was an excellent discussion. We really, uh, you know, enjoyed this. This is what we had planned for, right? Uh, very impromptu, everything for the audience. To I'll go to the audience and ask question. But before I go to the audience, I have a personal question to ask Manish. Uh, you spoke about, you know, India moving towards ten, uh, ten trillion dollar economy. It's an inevitable. Uh, it's only a question of when. Uh, in this whole context, uh, where do you or Ramdev look at the PSUs? Because you know, that's where the whole uh, investment seems to be. A lot of retail investors are very heavily invested in the PSU stocks. Uh, if both can answer that question on uh, the PSU investments. Yeah, I think uh, uh, 
this PSU category, I mean, categorizing the companies as PSU, non-PSU, I think that, that thing will get blurred in the sense that now there is a company and a company. Yeah. You, you decide on the basis of, uh, don't put a sticker as a PSU or non-PSU, and uh, there are bad PSUs, there are good PSUs. So if there are good PSUs are there, the CapEx companies, asset light companies, defense companies, which are monopolistic in character, obviously as the defense uh, indignation happens big time, Clearly, they are going to be beneficial, and it will be loved by the market. But there are very bad PSUs also. So uh, just because it is PSU, it is not a good company. And just because it is PSU, it is not a bad company also. So I think going forward, I would look at it on a merits rather than PSU or non-PSU. Yeah. Manish, you have a view on PSUs? Yeah, are you carrying this live? Yes, yes we are carrying it live. Okay, then I won't say certain things. <laughs> so, so, well, I own SBI as an example, that I think it's inevitable in banking, HDFC, SBI, they will, they will not compound at the fastest rate, but they have to be a core part of whatever you're holding and seeing ICICI Bank and all these, they're, they're just long, long runway to go over here. But to a short point, what I was hesitant to say, I'll try and rephrase it better, that the, the lack of the investment cycle in India is a lot to do with two things, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, and the end of telephone banking. Because a lot of projects which came earlier, the equity of the promoter came through the project itself. So project cost of one became one and a half miraculously. So that showed up in CAPEX numbers, which suddenly has vanished. And two, people got phone calls to put up more CAPEX, whether it was PSUs or through the PSU banks. Because that governance structure has got cleaned up, I think the market has caught on to it. So whether it is the banking sector, whether it is the individual uh, PSUs, uh, they always held dominant positions, but they were misused or they were not run for profit. And one thing which this government has done is not just come and run the administration better, but also ensure that the PSUs are run better uh, and they are accountable. Uh, in fact, uh, if there's a lesson which is to be taken from China, they have held now the PSUs, they're accountable for stock returns. So that's the next leg which should come here to give you the next leg of re-rating over there. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause at that. You remember my conversation, Ramesh and I used to always course, love course, uh, PSUs course. as well. Uh, Nigel, uh, you're, at the, uh, you're in the audience as well. If you want to reach out to some, uh, some people and ask questions. Yeah, that's right. But just one question uh, before uh, Manishi as well as Ramdev ji. Uh, you know, Modi ji 1.0, Modi ji 2.0, very good. And we're ready for Modi ji 3.0. What could be on your wish list? Oops. That he comes back with 400. <laughs> yeah, but so can, uh, in terms of... No, uh, see, there are few things which has been held back. For example, the farm, law, uh, farm laws, the labor reforms, the administrative reforms, judicial reforms, and the acceleration of this cycle, uh, I think, has been held back for various political reasons. If he gets enough legroom to push those through faster and accelerate us, like he said, to go to that 8-10% growth, it cannot happen in the absence of labor laws, getting people out of agriculture, getting urbanization, skilling them. So all that is something which small things add up, and that gives you the takeoff to the 10% growth number. It's like so I'm quite hopeful that this government comes and does that, and uh, they leave our capital gains the way it is, <laughs> and not increase that. Yeah, so it's like the batsman in good form, uh, you know, a couple of good innings, don't, don't and now it. all set to knock it out. Ramdoshi, you? Yeah, I think uh, one, of, one of the thing which uh, uh, most of the government miss out is the power of wealth creation by the stock market. The capital market, I think last year, has created uh, upwards about 120, 130 lakh crores mm -hmm. on a GDP of about, say, 300, 300 lakh crores. So we are talking about upwards of 30, 35 percent of GDP. When the GDP goes from seven and a half to eight, there is a headline. You imagine 35 percent of GDP you have stuffed in the pockets of all the guys. I mean, mostly in Mumbai, but. Uh, no, UP, UP are the biggest. Uh, yeah, so what I'm saying is next year, this year, another 20, 25 percent. I think you got to ask the economists. And they are, my sense is, one of the things they are missing out, uh, apart from this GVA calculation he gave me, I think, <laughs> is, is the wealth effect. See, the indirect, uh, direct and indirect tax collection is way beyond their revised estimates. And that is coming from the, all the speculation which is happening in the market. People are paying, they are gaining in the market, and they are, going, they are paying the taxes. And those taxes are the ones which are, I think, somewhere after two, three years, people will figure out that uh, there were three or four lakh crores more than what uh, government had budgeted. So I think the power of stock market, and I think that is a differentiator between India and China. 
And that's the difference between the US and the rest of the world. And that power should be harnessed very well. If you harness it well, we can be $10 trillion market economy in the next four years or five years. And that power should be harnessed. If you don't harness it, it can destroy also. OK, all right. I'm sure our audience as well are reaching to ask some questions. So uh, anyone, yeah. Well, Nigel, uh, in fact, I have, an, uh, I have a guest with me who wants to ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, if you can introduce uh, Yes. Hi, my name is Dhanja Bagrodia. I work for Manish Bhai uh, Renam, now with ASK. Uh, Manish Bhai and Ram, uh, just a couple of questions. So now we've seen ghars, uh, like electrification from 50% of the households to 90%. We've seen Jal Se Nal from 50% below to 90%. So we've done the low-hanging fruits. A, just, it's a two-part question. A, any other segments where you all will see now in 3.0, where you'll see big sectors? And Ramdas, sir, since you've been always talking about value migration, any segments where you are seeing something similar happen? I'm not talking about stock specific. Yeah, so my sense is that uh, the sector of the decade will be capital markets. And this will be benefiting not only from the savings reallocation, but also shift from bank deposits in terms of share, bank deposits to financial markets. So we are going to have a, I mean, it's not a journey of one or two years, three years, but all the capital market companies, and they are very asset light. The beauty is asset light. Banking is extremely asset heavy. Mm. So uh, the kind of uh, economic profit you are going to get, the excess return you are going to get beyond the cost of capital is going to be stupendous, and uh, it, they're monopolistic in character. If you look at these businesses, they're not 30, 40 depositories or 30, 40 exchanges, 30, 40 asset management companies. They are very, very asset management. Top five or six or 75 percent of all the assets. So, and you don't need anything. You don't need. You don't have even a capital adequacy. So, I think these are the companies which I think, uh, if you look at five years, they look a little expensive, a little pricey. But that's a sector to watch. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think financials. Overall is a big theme. Within that, we can keep moving from one horse to the other horse over the course of the next 10 years based on valuations. So I'd agree with that. Thank you, both of guests. OK, we have another question coming in here. Uh, hi, I'm Milap. I work with uh, tech companies in the US. And you guys spoke about uh, internet-enabled businesses. You spoke about uh, financialization. Uh, AI is the buzzword. Um, do you believe, as I do, that as you go stock picking and beyond the indices, like in the US, that we're going to see a dispersion of companies that are able to build AI models? Is data really the new oil? Or do you think it's one of those blips will go away? What impact will we see in the markets? I would love your take on that. No, I, uh, I'm actually, uh, for all the friends, I've been talking a lot about disruptive things coming. And this wave of technology which is coming is true. And the way I think of it, and it may be a useful framework, uh, they're, they're kind of making our brain into a superpower with AI. They're making our eyes into superpower with the use of AR and VR headsets. They're making our energy uh, requirements better, uh, coming from our heart into whatever you may call renewables or new energy, uh, what, what eventually may lead into EVs and batteries and so on and so forth, but that's energy. Uh, for all our limbs, there's robotics, which is coming. And then for our bodies, there is biotech. So five very, very big mega themes, which the Indian startup world is involved in. It's not yet in the stock market. So it will be people who are in their 20s and 30s who are going to come with this over the next 10 years. Uh, and that's where serious money will be made. I wish I were 20 years younger, so my son does all of this. Uh, but that's an interesting space uh, to do. And if we don't catch up, it will be like when we miss the Industrial Revolution 200, 300 years ago. If we miss this way, because China is way ahead of even America right now mm. in almost all of these. So I, I mean, that's one example we should have spoken. If we miss this bus, we can get it wrong. You, then, you know, then to get a billion people out from Africa into Philippines and then into Australia is, is a big, big, big task. Okay, uh, I have uh, my colleagues who will be next to me. I guess she wants to ask a question to both Ramdev and uh, Manish. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Uh, pleasure listening to both of you, you know, visionaries, market veterans. And I just want to go back and scratch that point that uh, Ramdev ji made on supply. Not that I'm trying to ask unpopular questions about concerns in the market, etc. But just to go back to it, and Manish, uh, your views, uh, the spate of block deals that we're seeing, and you know, there's all kinds of selling. There's promoter selling, there's you know, early investors, private equity selling. Then there's FII selling, which uh, you know, Nilesh and the mutual fund fraternity has been absorbing very, very well. 
but just the amount of selling that's coming in, could that at all become a near-term concern? And this club with a second concern, if I could just add, the mid-cap space, right? Uh, the way regulations are, you only have 150 stocks defined as mid-caps. That's your playground. Does that get restrictive? This whole talk of froth and bubble, it really you know, originated from, from that space just a few weeks ago. So let me try and address it. There. <laughs> Number one, I think we are all in agreement the valuations are discounting a lot of the future. It's not cheap by any measure. This is a market which is pricing a lot of the optimism. And therefore, it's natural if I was a private equity player for me to book my profit and go. If I'm a multinational in distress, like you, you saw an American company came and sold down their stake here to solve their balance sheet, or someone from UK came and sold down their large stake to solve their balance sheet problems, it was solving their problem taking advantage of a situation here. But what I find is this is an encouraging sign that it's a sign of a mature market where we are now concerned about velocity to give us returns rather than extracting margin. If, if you know the old way of thinking was high taxes, small number of people and squeeze them. And now we have moderate taxes, large number of people and let the velocity go, you know, similar to the capital market example. So just the way when Warburg Pinker sold Bharti, you know, way back in 2006, it opened the floodgates to private equity. I think the same thing when you see a SoftBank able to sell, a BAT able to sell, a Whirlpool able to sell. Imagine the electric current running in boardrooms, that there is value creation possible for us in India. And we should not stop our FDI from going here. Unlike other places where your investment in Russia can go to zero, potentially in China it could go to zero, but this is a place our capital is safe and protected. So I see it as a long-term positive thing. While it may create a short-term hiccup if that demand supply doesn't match for that week. Like I said about investing, you know, on a weekly and a monthly basis, it's a toying cost. But when you stretch that thing out, I think this is a very, very positive development for our country. Okay, that, that's the first. The second was this whole concept of mid-caps, 150 we, stocks. We have the expert here, Nilesh. He'll take it in his oh, session. Okay, in his session. <laughs> on, on all the categorizations. Sure. Well, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to the Jugal Bandi between Manish Chokhani and Ramdev Agrawal. Uh, lots of important uh, insights and, of course, lots of uh, anecdotes. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journeys. 30 years and 40 years, accumulatively, uh, a wealth of experience here being shared with us live on TV and, of course, here at the Jolie's Club uh, in Mumbai. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, a big round of applause for our two market veterans. <laughs>